A Treatise on the Predestination of the Saints by Aurelius Augustine, Pastor of Hippo, North Africa. The First Book. Address to Prosper and Hillary. Add. 428 or 429. Wherein the truth of predestination and grace is defended against the semi-Pelagians, those people, to wit, who by no means withdraw altogether from the Pelagian heresy, in that they contend that the beginning of salvation and of faith is of ourselves, so that in virtue, as it were, of this precedent merit, the other good gifts of God are attained. Augustine shows that not only the increase, but the very beginning also of faith, is in God's gift. On this matter he does not disavow that he once thought differently, and that in some small works, written before his episcopate, he was in error, as in that exposition, which they object to him, of propositions from the epistle to the Romans. But he points out that he was subsequently convinced chiefly by this testimony, but what hast thou that thou hast not received? Which he proves is to be taken as a testimony concerning faith itself also. He says that faith is to be counted among other works, which the Apostle denies to anticipate God's grace when he says, not of works. He declares that the hardness of the heart is taken away by grace, and that all come to Christ, who are taught to come by the Father, but that those whom he teaches, he teaches in mercy, while those whom he teaches not, in judgment he teaches not. That the passage from his hundred and second epistle, question two, concerning the time of the Christian religion, which is alleged by the semi-Pelagians, may rightly be explained without detriment to the doctrine of grace and predestination. He teaches what is the difference between grace and predestination. Further, he says that God in his predestination foreknew what he had proposed to do. He marvels greatly that the adversaries of predestination, who are said to be unwilling to be dependent on the uncertainty of God's will, prefer rather to trust themselves to their own weakness, than to the strength of God's promise. He clearly points out that they abuse this authority, if thou believest, thou shalt be saved. That the truth of grace and perseverance shines forth in the case of infants that are saved, who are distinguished by no merits of their own from others who perish. For that there is no difference between them arising from the foreknowledge of merits, which they would have had if they had lived longer. That the testimony is wrongfully rejected by the adversaries as being uncanonical, which he adduced for the purpose of this discussion, he was taken away lest wickedness, itetch. That the most illustrious instance of predestination and grace is the Saviour himself, in whom a man obtained the privilege of being the Saviour and the only begotten Son of God, through being assumed into oneness of person by the word co-eternal with the Father, on account of no precedent merits, either of works or of faith that the predestinated are called by some certain calling peculiar to the elect, and that they have been elected before the foundation of the world, not because they were foreknown as men, who would believe and would be holy, but in order, that by means of that very election of grace they might be such, itetch. Chap. 1 I Introduction. We know that in the epistle to the Philippians the apostle said, to write the same things to you to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Phil 3.1. Yet the same apostle, writing to the Galatians, when he saw that he had done enough among them of what he regarded as being needful for them, by the ministry of his preaching, said, For the rest let no man cause me labor, Galatians 6.17. Or as it is read in many codices, let no one be troublesome to me. But although I confess that it causes me trouble that the divine word, in which the grace of God is preached which is absolutely no grace, if it is given according to our merits, great and manifest as it is, is not yielded to, nevertheless my dearest sons, Prosper and Hilary, your zeal and brotherly affection, which makes you so reluctant to see any of the brethren in error, as to wish that, after so many books and letters of mine on this subject, I should write again from here I. Love more than I can tell, although I do not dare to say that I love it as much as I ought. Wherefore, behold, I write to you again. And although not with you, yet through you I am still doing, what I thought I had done sufficiently. Chap. 2. To what extent the Massilians 3 withdraw from the Pelagians? For on consideration of your letters, I seem to see that those brethren, on whose behalf you exhibit a pious care, that they may not hold the poetical opinion, in which it is affirmed, every one is a hope for himself, 
for and so fall under the condemnation which is, not poetically, but prophetically, declared, Cursed is every man, that hath hope in man, Jeremiah 17.5. Must be treated in that way, wherein the apostle dealt with those to whom he said, And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you Phil. 3.15. For as yet they are in darkness on the question concerning the predestination of the saints, but they have that whence, if in anything they are otherwise minded, God will reveal even this unto them, if they are walking in that to which they have attained. For which reason the apostle, when he had said, If ye are in anything otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you, says, Nevertheless, where ye unto we have attained, let us walk in the same. Phil 3.16. And those brethren of ours, on whose behalf your pious love is solicitous, have attained with Christ's church to the belief, that the human race is born obnoxious to the sin of the first man, and that none can be delivered from the evil save by the righteousness of the second man. Moreover, they have attained to the confession, that men's wills are anticipated by God's grace, and to the agreement, that no one can suffice to himself either for beginning or for completing any good work. These things, therefore, unto which they have attained, being held fast, abundantly distinguish them from the error of the Pelagians. Further, if they walk in them, and beseech him who giveth understanding, if in anything concerning predestination they are otherwise minded, he will reveal even this unto them. Yet let us also spend upon them the influence of our love, and the ministry of our discourse, according to his gift, whom we have asked that in these letters we might say what should be suitable or plain and profitable to them. For whence do we know whether by this our service, wherein we are serving them in the free love of Christ, our God may not perchance will to effect the purpose? Chap. 3 EI. Even the beginning of faith is of God's gift. Therefore I ought first to show that the faith, by which we are Christians is the gift of God, if I can do that more thoroughly than I have already done in so many and so large volumes. But I see that I must now reply to those who say that the divine testimonies, which I have adduced concerning this matter are of avail for this purpose, to assure us that we have faith itself of ourselves, but that its increase is of God, as if faith were not given to us by Him, but were only increased in us by Him, on the ground of the merit of its having begun from us. Thus there is here no departure from that opinion, which Pelagius himself was constrained to condemn in the judgment of the bishops of Palestine as is testified in the same proceedings, that the grace of God is given according to our merits. 5. If it is not of God's grace, that we begin to believe, but rather that on account of this beginning in addition is made to us of a more full and perfect belief, and so we first give the beginning of our faith to God, that a supplement may also be given to us again, and whatever else we faithfully ask. Chap. 4. Continuation of the preceding. But why do we not, in opposition to this, rather hear the words, who hath first given to him and it shall be recompensed to him again? Since of him, and through him, and in him, are all things? Romans 11.35 And from whom, then, is that very beginning of our faith if not from him? For this is not accepted, when other things are spoken of as of him, but of him, and through him, and in him, are all things. But who can say that he, who has already begun to believe deserves nothing from him in whom he has believed. Whence it results that, to him who already deserves, other things are said to be added by a divine retribution, and thus that God's grace is given according to our merits. And this assertion when put before him, Pelagius himself condemned, that he might not be condemned. Whoever, then, wishes on every side to avoid this condemnable opinion, let him understand, that what the Apostle says is said with entire truthfulness, unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Phil 1.29 he shows that both are the gifts of God, because he said that both were given. And he does not say, to believe on him more fully and perfectly, but, to believe on him. Neither does he say that he himself had obtained mercy to be more faithful, but to be faithful. 1 Corinthians 7.25 Because he knew that he had not first given the beginning of his faith to God, and had its increase given back to him again by him, but that he had been made faithful by God, who also had made him an apostle. For the beginnings of his faith are recorded, 
and they are very well known by being read in the church on an occasion calculated to distinguish them how, being turned away from the faith which he was destroying, and being vehemently opposed to it, he was suddenly by a more powerful grace converted to it, by the conversion of him, too, whom as one, who would do this very thing it was said by the prophet, Thou wilt turn and quicken us, Psalm 85.6. So that not only from one, who refused to believe he was made a willing believer, but, moreover, from being a persecutor, he suffered persecution in defense of that faith which he persecuted. Because it was given him by Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Chap. 5. To believe is to think with assent. And, therefore, commending that grace, which is not given according to any merits, but is because of all good merits, he says, not that we are sufficient to think anything is of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. 2 Corinthians 3.5 Let them give attention to this, and well weigh these words, who think that the beginning of faith is of ourselves, and the supplement of faith is of God. For who cannot see that thinking is prior to believing? For no one believes anything, unless he has first thought, that it is to be believed. For however suddenly, however rapidly, some thoughts fly before the will to believe, and this presently follows in such wise as to attend them, as it were, in closest conjunction, it is yet necessary, that everything, which is believed should be believed after thought has proceeded, although even belief itself is nothing else, than to think with assent. For it is not everyone who thinks that believes, since many think in order, that they may not believe, but everybody who believes, thinks, both thinks in believing, and believes in thinking. Therefore in what pertains to religion and piety of which the Apostle was speaking, if we are not capable of thinking anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, we are certainly not capable of believing anything as of ourselves, since we cannot do this without thinking, but our sufficiency, by which we begin to believe, is of God. Wherefore, as no one is sufficient for himself, for the beginning or the completion of any good work whatever, and this those brethren of yours, as what you have written intimates, already agree to be true, whence, as well in the beginning, as in the carrying out of every good work, our sufficiency is of God, so no one is sufficient for himself, either to begin or to perfect faith, but our sufficiency is of God. Because if faith is not a matter of thought, it is of no account, and we are not sufficient to think anything is of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Chap. 6. Presumption and arrogance to be avoided. Care must be taken, brethren, beloved of God, that a man do not lift himself up in opposition to God, when he says that he does what God has promised. Was not the faith of the nations promised to Abraham, and he, giving glory to God, most fully believed? that what he promised he is able also to perform? Romans 4.20 He therefore makes the faith of the nations, who is able to do what he has promised. Further, if God works our faith, acting in a wonderful manner in our hearts so that we believe, is there any reason to fear that he cannot do the whole, and does man on that account arrogate to himself its first elements, that he may merit to receive its last from God? Consider if in such a way any other result be gained, than that the grace of God is given in some way or other, according to our merits, and so grace is no more grace. For on this principle it is rendered as debt, it is not given gratuitously, for it is due to the believer, that his faith itself should be increased by the Lord, and that the increased faith should be the wages of the faith begun, nor is it observed when this is said, that this wage is assigned to believers, not of grace, but of debt. And I do not at all see, why the whole should not be attributed to man, as he who could originate for himself what he had not previously, can himself increase what he had originated, except that it is impossible to withstand the most manifest divine testimony, by which faith, whence piety takes its beginning, is shown also to be the gift of God such as is that testimony, that God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith, Romans 12.3 and that one, peace be to the brethren and love with faith, from God the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, if 6.23. And other similar passages. Man, therefore, unwilling to resist such clear testimonies as these, and yet desiring himself to have the merit of believing, compounds, as it were with God to claim a portion of faith for himself, and to leave a portion for him, 
and, what is still more arrogant, he takes the first portion for himself, and gives the subsequent to him, and so in that which he says belongs to both, he makes himself the first, and God the second. Chap. 7, 3. Augustine confesses that he had formerly been in error concerning the grace of God. It was not thus that that pious and humble teacher thought I speak of the most blessed Cyprian, when he said that we must boast in nothing, since nothing is our own. Sixth and in order to show this, he appealed to the apostle as a witness, where he said, For what hast thou that thou hast not received? And if thou hast received it, why boastest thou as if thou hadst not received it? 1 Corinthians 4.7 And it was chiefly by this testimony, that I myself also was convinced when I was in a similar error, thinking that faith, whereby we believe on God is not God's gift, but that it is in us from ourselves, and that by it we obtain the gifts of God, whereby we may live temperately and righteously and piously in this world. For I did not think that faith was preceded by God's grace, so that by its means would be given to us what we might profitably ask, except that we could not believe, if the proclamation of the truth did not proceed. But that we should consent, when the gospel was preached to us I thought was our own doing, and came to us from ourselves. And this my error is sufficiently indicated in some small works of mine written before my episcopate. Among these is, that which you have mentioned in your letters, 7 wherein is an exposition of certain propositions from the epistle to the Romans. Eventually, when I was retracting all my small works, and was committing that retractation to writing, of which task I had already completed two books, before I had taken up your more lengthy letters, when in the first volume I had reached the retractation of this book, I then spoke thus also discussing, I say, what God could have chosen in him who was as yet unborn, whom he said that the elder should serve, and what in the same elder, equally as yet unborn, he could have rejected, concerning whom, on this account, the prophetic testimony is recorded, although declared long subsequently, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated, Mal 1.2, 3. Compare. Romans 9.13. I carried out my reasoning to the point of saying God did not therefore choose the works of anyone in foreknowledge, of what he himself would give them, but he chose the faith, in the foreknowledge, that he would choose that very person, whom he foreknew would believe on him, to, whom he would give the Holy Spirit, so that by doing good works he might obtain eternal life also I had not yet very carefully sought, nor had I as yet found, what is the nature of the election of grace of which the Apostle says, a remnant are saved according to the election of grace Romans 11.5. Which assuredly is not grace if any merits precede it, lest what is now given, not according to grace, but according to debt, be rather paid to merits than freely given. And what I next subjoined for the same Apostle says, the same God which worketh all in all, 1 Corinthians 12.6. But it was never said, God believeth all in all, and then added, therefore what we believe is our own, but what good thing we do is of him who giveth the Holy Spirit to them, that believe I certainly could not have said, had I already known that faith itself also is found among those gifts of God, which are given by the same Spirit. Both, therefore, are ours on account of the choice of the will, and yet both are given by the Spirit of faith and love. For faith is not alone, but, as it is written, love with faith, from God the Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ if 4.23. And what I said a little after, for it is ours to believe and to will, but it is his to give to those who believe and will, the power of doing good works through the Holy Spirit, by whom the love is shed abroad in our hearts, is true indeed, but by the same rule both are also God's, because God prepares the will, and both are ours too, because they are only brought about with our good wills. And thus what I subsequently said also, because we are not able to will unless we are called, and when, after our calling, we would will, our willing is not sufficient, nor our running, unless God gives strength to us that run, and leads us whither he calls us, and thereupon added it is plain, therefore, that it is not of him that will left, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy, that we do good works, this is absolutely most true. But I discovered little concerning the calling itself, which is according to God's purpose, for not such is the calling of all that are called, but only of the elect. 
Therefore what I said a little afterwards for as in, those whom God elected is not works but faith, that begins the merit so as, to do good works by the gift of God, so in those whom he condemns, unbelief and impiety begin the merit of punishment, so that even by way of punishment itself they do evil works, I spoke most truel. But that even the merit itself of faith was God's gift, I neither thought of inquiring into, nor did I say. And in another place I say for whom he has mercy upon, he makes to do good works, and whom he hardened of he leaves to do evil works, but that mercy is bestowed upon the preceding merit of faith, and that hardening is applied to preceding iniquity and this indeed is true, but it should further have been asked, whether even the merit of faith does not come from God's mercy, that is, whether that mercy is manifested in man only because he is a believer, or whether it is also manifested that he may be a believer? For we read in the Apostles' words I obtain mercy, to be a believer 1 Corinthians 7.25. He does not say, because I was a believer therefore, although it is given to the believer, yet it has been given also that he may be a believer. Therefore, also, in another place in the same book I most truly said because, if it is of God's mercy, and not of works, that we are even called that we may believe, and it is granted to us who believe to do good works, that mercy must not be grudged to the heathen, although I their discourse bless carefully about that calling, which is given according to God's purpose. 8 Chap. 8 I've. What Augustine wrote to Simplicianus, the successor of Andrews, Bishop of Milan. You see plainly what was at that time my opinion concerning faith and works, although I was laboring in commanding God's grace and in this opinion I see that those brethren of ours now are, because they have not been as careful to make progress with me in my writings, as they were in reading them. For if they had been so careful, they would have found that question solved in accordance with the truth of the divine scriptures in the first book of the two, which I wrote in the very beginning of my Episcopate to Simplicianus, of blessed memory, Bishop of the Church of Milan, and successor to Ambrose. Unless, perchance, they may not have known these books, in which case, take care, that they do know them. Of this first of those two books, I first spoke in the second book of the Retractations, and what I said is as follows of the books, I say, on which, as a bishop, I have labored, the first two are addressed to Simplicianus, president of the Church of Milan, who succeeded the most blessed Ambrose, concerning divers questions, two of which I gathered into the first book from the epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Romans. The former of them is, about what is written what shall we say, then? Is the law sin? By no means, Romans 7.7. As far as the passage where he says, Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? The grace of God through Jesus Christ our Lord Romans 7.24. And therein I have expounded those words of the Apostle the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, Romans 7.14 and others in which the flesh is declared to be in conflict against the spirit, in such a way, as if a man were there described as still under law, and not yet established under grace. For, long afterwards, I perceived that those words might even be, and probably were the utterance of a spiritual man. The latter question in this book is gathered from that passage where the apostle says, and not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one act of intercourse, even by our father Isaac, Romans 9.10. As far as that place where he says, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we should be as Sodoma, and should have been like unto Gomorrah, Romans 9.29. In the solution of this question I labored indeed on behalf of the free choice of the human will, but God's grace overcame, and I could only reach that point, where the apostle is perceived to have said with the most evident truth, for who maketh thee to differ? And what hast thou that thou hast not received? Now, if thou hast received it, why dost thou glory as if thou receivedst it not 1 Corinthians 4.7? And this the martyr Cyprian was also desirous of setting forth, when he compressed the whole of it in that title, that we must boast in nothing, since nothing is our own nine this is, why I previously said that it was chiefly by this apostolic testimony, that I myself had been convinced when I thought otherwise concerning this matter, and this God revealed to me, as I sought to solve this question when I was writing, as I said, to the bishop Simplicianus. This testimony, therefore, of the apostle, 
when for the sake of repressing man's conceit he said, For what hast thou which thou hast not received? 1 Corinthians 4.7 Does not allow any believer to say, I have faith which I received not. All the arrogance of this answer is absolutely repressed by these apostolic words. Moreover, it cannot even be said, Although I have not a perfected faith, yet I have its beginning, whereby I first of all believed in Christ. Because here also is answered, But what hast thou that thou hast not received? Now, if thou hast received it, why dost thou glory as if thou receivedst it not? Chap. 9 v. The purpose of the apostle in these words. The notion, however, which they entertain, that these words, What hast thou that thou hast not received cannot be said of this faith, because it has remained in the same nature, although corrupted, which at first was endowed with health and perfection. 10 is perceived to have no force for the purpose that they desire, if it be considered why the apostle said these words. For he was concerned that no one should glory in man, because dissensions had sprung up among the Corinthian Christians, so that every one was saying, I, indeed, am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, and another, I am of Cephas, 1 Corinthians 1.12 and thence he went on, to say God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the strong things, and God hath chosen the ignoble things of the world, and contemptible things, and those things which are not to make of no account things which are, that no flesh should glory before God. 1 Corinthians 1.27 Here the intention of the apostle is of a certainty sufficiently plain against the pride of man, that no one should glory in man, and thus, no one should glory in himself. Finally, when he had said that no flesh should glory before God, in order to show in what man ought to glory, he immediately added, But it is of him that ye are in Christ Jesus, who is made unto us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption that according as it is written, He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 1.30 Thence that intention of this progressed, till afterwards rebuking them he says, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there are among you envying and contention, are ye not carnal, and walk according to men? For while one saith I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not men? What, then, is Apollos, and what Paul? Ministers by whom you believed, and to every one, as the Lord has given. I have planted, and Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Therefore, neither is he that planteth anything, nor he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. 1 Corinthians 3.3 in following do you not see that the sole purpose of the apostle is that man may be humbled, and God alone exalted? Since in all those things, indeed, which are planted and watered, he says that not even are the planter and the waterer anything, but God who giveth the increase and the very fact, also, that one plant and another waters he attributes not to themselves, but to God, when he says, to every one, as the Lord hath given, I have planted, Apollos watered. Hence, therefore, persisting in the same intention he comes to the point of saying, Therefore let no man glory in man, 1 Corinthians 3.21. For he had already said, He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. After these and some other matters which are associated therewith, that same intention of his is carried on in the words and these things, Brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us, that no one of you should be puffed up for one against another above that which is written. For who maketh thee to differ? And what hast thou which thou hast not received? Now, if thou hast received it, why dost thou glory as if thou receivedst it not? 1 Corinthians 4.6 Chap. 10 It is God's grace which specially distinguishes one man from another. In this the Apostle's most evident intention, in which he speaks against human pride, so that none should glory in man but in God, it is too absurd, as I think, to suppose God's natural gifts, whether man's entire and perfected nature itself, as it was bestowed on him in his first state, or the remains, whatever they may be, of his degraded nature. For is it by such gifts as these, which are common to all men, that men are distinguished from men? But here he first said, For who maketh thee to differ? And then added, 
and what hast thou that thou hast not received? Because a man, puffed up against another, might say, My faith makes me to differ, or my righteousness, or anything else of the kind. In reply to such notions, the good teacher says, But what hast thou that thou hast not received? And from whom but from him who maketh thee to differ from another, on whom he bestowed not what he bestowed on thee? Now if, says he, thou hast received it, why dost thou glory as if thou receivedst it not? Is he concerned, I ask, about anything else save that he who glorieth should glory in the Lord? But nothing is so opposed to this feeling, as for any one to glory concerning his own merits in such a way, as if he himself had made them for himself, and not the grace of God, a grace, however, which makes their good to differ from the wicked, and is not common to the good and the wicked. Let the grace, therefore, whereby we are living in reasonable creatures, and are distinguished from cattle, be attributed to nature, let that grace also by wish, among men themselves, the handsome are made to differ from the informed, or the intelligent from the stupid, or anything of that kind, be ascribed to nature. But he whom the apostle was rebuking did not puff himself up as contrasted with cattle, nor as contrasted with any other man, in respect of any natural endowment, which might be found even in the worst of men. But he ascribed to himself, and not to God, some good gift which pertained to a holy life, and was puffed up therewith, when he deserved to hear the rebuke, who hath made thee to differ. And what hast thou that thou receivedst not? For though the capacity to have faith is of nature, is it also of nature to have it? For all men have not faith, to THES. 3.2. Although all men have the capacity to have faith. But the Apostle does not say, And what hast thou capacity to have, the capacity to have which thou receivedst not? But he says, And what hast thou which thou receivedst not? Accordingly, the capacity to have faith, eleven as the capacity to have love, belongs to man's nature but to have faith, even as to have love, belongs to the grace of believers. That nature, therefore, in which is given to us the capacity of having faith, does not distinguish man from man, but faith itself makes the believer to differ from the unbeliever. And thus, when it is said, For who maketh thee to differ? And what hast thou that thou receivedst not? If any one dare to say, I have faith of myself, I did not, therefore, receive it. He directly contradicts this most manifest truth, not because it is not in the choice of man's will, to believe or not to believe, but because in the elect the will is prepared by the Lord. Thus, moreover, the passage, For who maketh thee to differ? And what hast thou that thou receivedst not? Refers to that very faith, which is in the will of man. Chap. 11 Vi. That some men are elected is of God's mercy. Many hear the word of truth, but some believe, while others contradict. Therefore, the former will to believe, the latter do not will. Who does not know this? Who can deny this? But since in some the will is prepared by the Lord, in others it is not prepared, we must assuredly be able to distinguish what comes from God's mercy, and what from his judgment. What is real sought for, says the apostle, he hath not obtained, but the election hath obtained it and the rest were blinded, as it is written, God gave to them the spirit of compunction, a's, that they should not see, and ears, that they should not hear, even to this day. And David said, Let their table be made a snare, a retribution, and a stumbling block to them, let their eyes be darkened, that they may not see, and bow down their back always. Romans 11.7 Here is mercy and judgment, mercy towards the election which has obtained the righteousness of God, but judgment to the rest which have been blinded. And yet the former, because they willed, twelve believed, the latter, because they did not will believed not. Therefore mercy and judgment were manifested in the very wills themselves. Certainly such an election is of grace, not at all of merits. For he had before said, so, therefore, even at this present time, the remnant has been saved by the election of grace. And if by grace, now it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. Romans 11.5 Therefore the election obtained what it obtained gratuitously, there proceeded none of those things, which they might first give, and it should be given to them again. He saved them for nothing. 
but to the rest who were blinded, as is there plainly declared, it was done in recompense. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth. Psalm 25.10 But his ways are unsearchable. Therefore the mercy by which he freely delivers, and the truth by which he righteously judges, are equally unsearchable. Chap. 12, 7. Why the Apostle said that we are justified by faith and not by works. But perhaps it may be said the Apostle distinguishes faith from works, he says, indeed, that grace is not of works, but he does not say that it is not of faith. This, indeed, is true. But Jesus says that faith itself also is the work of God, and commands us to work it. For the Jews said to him, What shall we do that we may work the work of God? Jesus answered, and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. John 6.28 The Apostle, therefore, distinguishes faith from works, just as Judah is distinguished from Israel in the two kingdoms of the Hebrews, although Judah is Israel itself. And he says that a man is justified by faith and not by works, because faith itself is first given, from which may be obtained other things, which are specially characterized as works, in which a man may live righteously. For he himself also says, By grace ye are saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, but it is the gift of God, if 2.8. That is to say, and in saying, through faith, even faith itself is not of yourselves, but is God's gift. Not of works, he says, lest any man should be lifted up. For it is often said, he deserved to believe, because he was a good man even before he believed. Which may be said of Cornelius, Acts 10. Since his alms were accepted, and his prayers heard before he had believed on Christ, and yet without some faith he neither gave alms nor prayed. For how did he call on him on whom he had not believed? But if he could have been saved without the faith of Christ, the Apostle Peter would not have been sent as an architect to build him up, although, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain who build it. Psalm 127.1 And we are told, faith is of ourselves, other things which pertain to works of righteousness are of the Lord, as if faith did not belong to the building, as if, I say, the foundation did not belong to the building. But if this primarily and especially belongs to it, he labors in vain, who seeks to build up the faith by preaching, unless the Lord in his mercy builds it up from within. Whatever, therefore, of good works Cornelius performed, as well before he believed in Christ, as when he believed and after he had believed, are all to be ascribed to God, lest, perchance any man be lifted up. Chap. 13, 8. The Effect of Divine Grace Accordingly, our only Master and Lord Himself, when He had said what I have above mentioned, this is the work of God, that ye believe on Him whom He hath sent, says a little afterwards in that same discourse of His, I said unto you that ye also have seen Me and have not believed. All that the Father giveth Me shall come to Me. John 6.36 What is the meaning of shall come to Me, but, shall believe in Me? But it is the Father's gift that this may be the case. Moreover, a little after he says, murmur not among yourselves. No one can come to me, except the Father, which hath sent me draw him. And I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all teachable thirteen of God. Every man, that hath heard of the Father, and hath learned, cometh unto me. John 6.43 what is the meaning of, every man that hath heard from the Father, and hath learned, cometh unto me, except that there is none, who hears from the Father, and learns, who cometh not to me. For if every one, who has heard from the Father, and has learned, comes, certainly every one, who does not come has not heard from the Father, for if he had heard and learned, he would come. For no one has heard and learned, and has not come, but every one, as the truth declares, who has heard from the Father, and has learned, comes. Far removed from the senses of the flesh is this teaching in which the Father is heard, and teaches to come to the Son. Engaged herein is also the Son himself, because he is his word by which he thus teaches, and he does not do this through the ear of the flesh, but of the heart. Herein engaged, also, at the same time, is the Spirit of the Father and of the Son, and he, too, teaches, 
and does not teach separately, since we have learned that the workings of the Trinity are inseparable. And that is certainly the same Holy Spirit, of whom the Apostle says, we, however, having the same Spirit of faith. 2 Corinthians 4.13 But this is especially attributed to the Father, for the reason that of Him is begotten the only begotten, and from Him proceeds the Holy Spirit, of which it would be tedious to argue more elaborately, and I think that my work in fifteen books on the Trinity which God is, has already reached you. Very far removed, I say, from the senses of the flesh is this instruction, wherein God is heard and teaches. We see that many come to the Son, because we see that many believe on Christ, but when and how they have heard this from the Father, and have learned, we see not. It is true that that grace is exceedingly secret, but who doubts that it is grace? This grace, therefore, which is hiddenly bestowed in human hearts by the divine gift, is rejected by no hard heart, because it is given for the sake of first taking away the hardness of the heart. When, therefore, the Father is heard within, and teaches, so that a man comes to the Son, he takes away the heart of stone and gives a heart of flesh, as in the declaration of the prophet he has promised. Because he thus makes them children and vessels of mercy, which he has prepared for glory. Chap. 14. Why the Father does not teach all that they may come to Christ. Why, then, does he not teach all that they may come to Christ, except because all whom he teaches, he teaches in mercy, while those whom he teaches not, in judgment he teaches not. Since, on whom he will he has mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Rom 9.18 but he has mercy, when he gives good things. He hardens when he recompenses what is deserved. Or if, as some would prefer to distinguish them, those words also are his to whom the apostle says, Thou sayest then unto me, so that he may be regarded as having said, Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will, and whom he will he hardeneth, as well as those which follow, to wit, what is it that is still complained of? For who resists his will? Does the apostle answer, O man? What thou hast said is false. No, but he says, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Doth the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump? Romans 9.28 and following and what follows, which you very well know. And yet in a certain sense the Father teaches all men, to come to his Son. For it was not in vain that it was written in the prophets and they shall all be teachable of God. John 6.45 And when he too had premised this testimony, he added, Every man, therefore, who has heard of the Father, and has learned, cometh to me. As, therefore, we speak justly when we say concerning any teacher of literature who is alone in a city, he teaches literature here to everybody, not that all men learn, but that there is none, who learns literature there who does not learn from him, so we justly say, God teaches all men to come to Christ, not because all come, but because none comes in any other way. And why he does not teach all men the apostle explained, as far as he judged that it was to be explained, because, willing to show his wrath, and to exhibit his power, he endured with much patience the vessels of wrath, which were perfected for destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he has prepared for glory. Romans 9.22 Hence it is that the word of the cross is foolishness to them that perish, but unto them that are saved it is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1.18 God teaches all such to come to Christ, for he wills all such to be saved, and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And if he had willed to teach even those two, whom the word of the cross is foolishness to come to Christ, beyond all doubt these also would have come. For he neither deceives nor is deceived when he says, Every one, that hath heard of the Father, and hath learned, cometh to me. Away, then, with the thought that any one cometh not, who has heard of the Father and has learned. Chap. 15. It is believers, that are taught of God. Why, say they, does he not teach all men? If we should say that they, whom he does not teach are unwilling to learn, we shall be met with the answer, and what becomes of what is said to him, O God, thou wilt turn us again, and quicken us? Psalm 80.7 Or if God does not make men willing who were not willing, 
On what principle does the church pray, according to the Lord's commandment, for her persecutors? For thus also the blessed Cyprian 14 would have it, to be understood that we say, Thy will be done, as in heaven so in earth, that is, as in those who have already believed, and who are, as it were, heaven, so also in those who do not believe, and on this account are still the earth. What, then, do we pray for on behalf of those who are unwilling to believe, except that God would work in them to will also? Certainly the Apostle says, Brethren, my heart's good will, indeed, and my prayer to God for them, is for their salvation. Romans 10.1